Maybe the president's most important job is commander in chief. Uh, the writers of the constitutions wanted a civilian in, uh, in charge of the military, which is always interesting. A lot of people will say the president needs to shut up and listen to his generals. That's a really un-American thing to say. The constitution makes it very clear that the generals should not be in charge of making decisions about our military. Um, but then the president makes important military decisions. I mean, look at all the wars. Lincoln, of course, was the commander in chief during the Civil War. Uh, uh, FDR was the commander in chief during World War II. Woodrow Wilson during World War I. And, of course, the numerous smaller wars along the way. The president commands a standing military and a nuclear arsenal, uh, which, which, by the way, the founding fathers would have been incredibly against. They did not like standing armies, um, and they certainly would, would not have been prepared for the level of technology our military has today. By the way, we spend as much on defense, as almost as much on defense, as the entire rest of the world combined. So this is a major power. But war powers are not the president's alone. They're shared with Congress. The, pre the, con uh, the president can order the troops uh, where they go, but Congress declares war. Now, this is an important uh, separation of powers idea and a check and a balance. So the president can send troops into an area, but he can't declare a war, and Congress can declare a war, and they can't send troops into the area. Now, this is also a great example of how uh, the separation of powers doesn't really work because what, we've, what, what the presidents have figured out is if they send troops into an area and shooting breaks out, the public will demand war, and there's nothing Congress can do to stop it. So you think of the Mexican-American War, where Polk sends troops down to the border. In the eyes of the Mexicans, anyway, he invades Mexico. Uh, there may or may not have been shooting. Many historians believe that, Polk, uh, that Zachary Taylor and Polk just lied and said they were shot at. But then he was able to go to Congress and say, they're shooting at us. What are you going to do? And Cong uh, members of Congress don't want to look like they're weak. They don't want to look unwilling to defend the country. And so they give the declaration of war. Vietnam is a very similar story. Uh, apparently, our military commanders lied to LBJ, told him that a boat in the Gulf of Tonkin, the USS Maddox, was attacked. It was not. That was completely made up. And uh, even congressmen who didn't support the war felt pressured to vote for it because we had been shot at. So if the president wants a war, all he has to do is put our troops in harm's way, wait till somebody gets shot at, and then turn to Congress and say, what are you, chicken? And Congress will give him what he wants. So in reality, what was supposed to be a separation of powers hasn't worked out very well. Now, after Vietnam, Congress tries to fix this with the War Powers Resolution. The intent was to prevent the president from precipitating war on his own. And what it says is the president has to consult with Congress and get a declaration of war uh, uh, after, uh, by the time uh, it, he can only put troops in harm's way for 60 days before he gets permission from Congress. Well, this is a disaster for Congress because they, they just gave the president two months to start a war anytime he wants without having to ask Congress anything. So what was it intended to limit the president's ability to create war, in reality dramatically uh, expanded, in fact kind of put into law that the president could create war. Because there's no way that Congress is going to say no to a war if our boys are being killed by a foreign power. The presidents, by the way, all of them, uh, from Nixon to Obama, have have, have said that the War Powers Resolution is unconstitutional, that it limits the president's ability to order the troops and therefore violates the separation of powers. Now, this has never come up in court, but it'll be an interesting question when it does. The president is a crisis manager, uh, and, and really presidents are often judged by what they do in a crisis. Uh, FDR's reaction to Pearl Harbor, George W. Bush's reaction to 9-11 are extreme examples, but of course there are smaller crises along the way. Uh, you, you may not be familiar with this, but Eisenhower's presidency, his first term, or second term, uh, uh, the sh was largely shaped, um, no, his first term, by his reaction to the Suez Crisis, um, which was a situation involving Israel and Egypt. And so when these things come up, uh, the Hurricane Katrina comes to mind, Hurricane Sandy recently here, with, or Superstorm Sandy with Obama. With current technology, the president can act almost instantly. Remember, in the, the Founding Fathers, we're dealing with a time when you had to deliver messages by boat or by horse or something, and, and it was very hard to mobilize quickly. Uh, but the president, of course, can react right away. He can be woken up in the middle of the night, and with minutes he can deploy troops or deploy aid to somebody who needs it uh, and, and issue a response. Congress is 535 people. It's very difficult for them to organize and do anything quickly. So the president, by the nature of being one person and his ability to react to a situation quickly, uh, ha has made his role more and more important. And when there is a crisis, uh, the president's uh, importance is that much more exaggerated. The president has the lead role in foreign affairs, but he still needs Congress's support. Congress provides all the funding, and Congress has to approve his treaties and his appointments of ambassadors. So this is another case where the president has to work with Congress.